In this second lecture on defenses, we're going to take a look at specialized defenses against a whole series of issues, and we're going to end up with immune response to infection. And the purpose of this is to show you what a broad range of mechanisms are deployed to help defend the body against environmental insult. We'll start with starvation. One issue that arises is that the more frequently a factor is encountered, then the more likely it is that a mechanism will evolve. This is, this is just general evolutionary biology. So the common defense mechanisms, and we'll see this with starvation, are all modified extensions of homeostatic systems. And those systems are operating all the time. So basically what evolution did was take a feature of physiology that evolved for normal maintenance and it then modified it to become a defense mechanism. Many defenses have specialized characteristics then that are only expressed under environmental stress, but they're derived from homeostatic mechanisms. So starvation. Our normal metabolism undergoes changes between meals. So glycogen and lipid synthesis happen right after a meal, and then a few hours later, there's gluconeogenesis before the next meal. So this is a method of keeping circulating uh, nutrients in the blood on an even keel when meals are coming in in pulses. When food deprivation persists, so when we skip meals, uh, when we are dieting, then the metabolism shifts to a fasting response. The first thing that happens is the glycogen stores are used up. Any runner knows this in a marathon. It's called hitting the wall. All the glycogen in the liver is used up. And then gluconeogenesis is, becomes the main source of glucose. Fat starts to be broken down in lipolysis, and most of the tissues in the body switch from glucose to fatty acid as the main metabolic fuel. The remaining glucose is saved for the brain, and you will see that the brain is prioritized through a variety of physiological processes. When starvation begins, then the liver starts synthesizing ketone bodies. Ketone bodies is actually kind of misleading. These are all molecules, so it's making acetone, acetoacetic acid, and beta-hydroxybutyric acid. These then become the main fuel for most tissues. And at this point, that includes the brain. So basically, the body is run out of glucose, and it is shifting to things that it can metabolize from other sources. When starvation is extreme and fat stores are completely depleted, then the breakdown of protein and skeletal muscle starts to provide amino acids as a food source. So metabolic defenses against extreme food deprivation are extensions of the fasting response that occurs between meals normally. But, of course, it's digging deeper and deeper into potential food reserves. Now, the illustration here, which probably looks to you like a person who might have survived a concentration camp in the Second World War, is actually from a Civil War concentration camp. It was called Andersonville. It was in the South, and this is a northern soldier who has managed to survive cholera and starvation in Andersonville, and it shows you just how much can be taken out of a human body without that person dying. Dehydration, water loss. Now, the issue of water in the tissues is intimately tied to circulation, and cardiovascular and renal systems are normally operating to maintain a normal blood volume and a vascular blood pressure. During the dehydration, there are adaptive changes in vascular tone, in heart rate, in renal reabsorption, and these protect from loss in blood volume and from a drop in blood pressure. Urine and sweat become more concentrated to reduce water loss. Uh, if you are losing a tremendous amount of water through sweat, you will hardly urinate at all. And there is a careful regulation between the amount of water going out through the skin and the amount of water going out through urine. So these adaptive 
changes are extensions of just normal homeostatic control of electrolyte balance and blood pressure. And they, they are actually being monitored and adjusted minute by minute in, in the kidneys and in the hypothalamus. A good friend of mine was on a Stanford research cruise in the South Pacific where it was extremely hot and people were losing a lot of water all the time and he said it was delightful because he could drink all the beer that he wanted to and he never had to go to the bathroom. So that shows you what an extreme case might be. What about thermoregulation and what happens to us either in extreme heat or extreme cold? Core body temperature is nearly constant in birds and mammals and any change in ambient temperature is going to stimulate either adaptive thermogenesis or heat dissipation. These mechanisms operate under normal conditions, but they really go into overdrive when environmental temperature changes are extreme. Cold will stimulate the hypothalamus to activate antagonistic skeletal muscles that causes heat to be produced by shivering. And brown fat, which actually is present particularly in human infants, but is widely distributed uh, among mammals, it produces heat without shivering, and it does it by uncoupled oxidative phosphorylation. Interestingly, in neonates and in infants and young children, abundant brown fat is near vital organs and it's near arteries that are supplying blood, for example, to the brain. So there are methods of activating a particular issue that's like a little heat packet in the body, and it's located in places where maintaining temperature is particularly important. Cold adaptation reduces heat, ad heat dissipation by decreasing blood flow to the skin and to the extremities. So when we get cold, we maintain core temperature, but we notice that our hands and our feet are starting to get, become especially cold. Adaptation to heat, on the other hand, causes increased blood flow to the skin, activation of sweat glands, and if we look comparatively, you can see that heat will shift in an African elephant, for example, into its large ears in order to dissipate. So you can see that uh, a lot of our adjustment to temperature is something that we've dealt with culturally as well clothes, central heating, all of that is part of our cultural thermoregulation. What about fight or flight? This is a defense against predation and against antagonism. And it's activated if there is a sudden dramatic need for a physical response. And that can happen either because of predator attack or because of a fight. It's controlled by a strong increase in the output of the sympathetic nervous system, and it results in an increased heart rate, increased respiration rate, and a shift in cardiac output to skeletal, skeletal muscle. So even if you've just had a big meal and you have a lot of blood concentrated uh, around your intestine and liver, if you're attacked by a predator, that will shut down very quickly, and you'll have a big output into skeletal muscle. This is just an exaggerated version of normal sympathetic control of how energy is being allocated through the body, whether it's going into a digestive or respiratory function or into skeletal function. So here is a picture of a fight and that kind of thing, unfortunately, <laughs> over our history has happened a lot and we have needed this response for that. And here is a lover who is escaping through the window as an angry husband comes in. And in both of these situations, there's been a big reallocation into skeletal muscle so that one can either aggress or run quickly. Now, what about tissue repair and blood clotting? This is what will happen if you get injured in a fight or you don't get away from a predator. The cells that are lost during injury are going to be replenished by increased proliferation of parenchymal cells or usually tissues have corresponding stem cells. And so they will be recruited. And that can take a while. 
This is actually just an enhanced version of the normal tissue renewal in which tissue stem cells are continuously making newly differentiated cells. That happens in different tissues at different characteristic rates. The blood clotting cascade is activated by vascular damage and that prevents blood loss and promotes repair of damaged blood vessels. And although blood clotting per se only occurs after vascular damage, it's an exaggerated version of hemostasis that's operating normally to promote vascular integrity. Blood vessels can't operate normally in the absence of platelets and other components of the clotting machinery. So here you can see uh, a look at a second degree burn and the kind of activation of tissue repair that goes on after an injury. And here is a scanning EM of some blood cells and platelets. The platelets are, these, this is a red blood cell. This is a T lymphocyte. But then these little particles down here are platelets, and they will participate in blood clotting. Interestingly, those all, everything you're seeing in this picture is made by the same uh, stem cell in the, in the bone marrow. So it, it has the ability to differentiate into all of these different types, cell types, and platelets. Then there's the defense mechanism that we call pain, or nociception. It's a vital response, and it can respond to mechanical, chemical, and thermal damage. It's essential to avoid tissue damage, and we see that most clearly in people who lack pain perception. That is a life-threatening condition. It's called congenital analgesia, and without special measures, it will be lethal because people just won't notice when they're getting damaged. So, Although acute pain only occurs during tissue damage, secondary pain, which is mediated by C, fi C fibers, plays a very important homeostatic role. The C fiber pain receptors can be activated by some hostile event, some noxious stimulus, even in the absence of tissue damage. So just to illustrate the fact that we perceive so frequently in our daily lives. Here's a person having a blood sample drawn and experiencing pain. And normally that is something that uh, is a signal. You want to stay away from that. Then we come to the inflammatory response. And as we go on through these lectures, you'll see that inflammation is part of a mechanism that mediates trade-offs all over the body and for many different diseases. It's activated by infection and injury. There are specialized cells in the immune system that coordinate inflammation. And inflammation is something that helps to maintain tissue integrity and homeostasis. Basically, inflammation is a signal of a local uh, pathogen invasion or tissue damage. And it causes the blood vessels to loosen up so that repair cells can get out through the blood vessels into the tissue. And as the blood vessels loosen up, then you also get some red blood cells that are leaking into the tissue, and that's why it looks pink. You actually have a, a local leak, an adaptive leak in the system. So macrophages and mast cells detect noxious stimuli and they are the things that produce this response. They produce cytokines, chemokines, biogenic amines, prostaglandins, things like that. And those cause a local vascular response, but they also cause a recruitment response. So they are a signal that, hey, we need help, and cells migrate. At the expense of normal functions, these mediators act on target tissues and they induce defensive change. So these effects of inflammatory mediators are antagonistic to and they dominate the homeostatic signals of hormones and neurotransmitters. So it's kind of an emergency override and that really disrupts normal homo homeostatic function. And that's why a dysregulated inflammation can lead to a disease of homeostasis, such as type 2 diabetes. The inflammatory responses also result in collateral tissue damage and organ failure. 
So if you have an extreme inflammatory response, that can be deadly. That could produce, for example, septic shock. So inflammation is one of those cases where you have a very large benefit, but there are very large costs which are normally balanced by those benefits, but if it's dysregulated and the costs emerge, the patient can die. So here is just an example of a contact dermatitis. This might be poison ivy or something like that. And you can see that there is a lot of fluid that is kind of pink, which has leaked out into parts of the tissues where it's not normally there. And that is because the inflammatory response has actually caused the arteries in that part of the body to open up and the, uh, the capillaries actually have become leaky so that things can get out into the so cells and um, molecules can get out of the vasculature into the tissues and deal with local tissue damage. Then we have allergic defenses and these uh, are operating in barrier tissues. So we don't have allergies in all of our tissues. They are usually localized into the skin and into the mucosa of the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, and the urogenital tracts. So those are places where our bodies are coming into frequent contact with external pathogens and toxins. Allergies are normal responses to things like venoms, irritants, xenobiotics, phytochemicals, we just saw a case of something like uh, poison ivy, and various enzymes, for example, in wasp venom, and even heavy, heavy metals like nickel. I actually have an allergy to the metals that are in my wedding ring. It makes my wife raise her eyebrows a little bit, but I have an allergic response to heavy metals in a wedding ring. The main defenses expel the substances and they reinforce the barriers. The idea being get it out and then close the door. So allergic symptoms are manifestations of these kinds of defenses. Mucus production enhances mucosal barriers, so you get a runny nose. The airway, bron the, the bronchi can be obstructed. Bronchoconstriction prevents further exposure to airborne substances. Sneezing and coughing gets noxious things out. Vomiting and diarrhea remove noxious substances from the GI tract. And itching can remove noxious substances from the skin. So those are all unpleasant symptoms, but they're also ways of getting the irritant out of the body. They have high costs and they have significant discomfort. And actually the discomfort is part of the defense because it produces an avoidance response. If that happens to you, you're going to try to stay away from it. So the benefits of allergy are analogous to the benefits of pain. They are unpleasant in order to protect. Now, what happens if we get a poison in our body? Well, we have a detoxification response. If we're exposed to a toxic environmental chemical, a so-called noxious xenobiotic, that elicits a different kind of protective response. It's based on the metabolic modification of noxious chemicals and their subsequent e excretion. Much of this is mediated by the two gene families that are coding for cytochrome P450s, CYPs, and sulfotransferases. This defense system protects from reactive chemicals and it presumably evolved to defend us from phytochemicals, secondary uh, compounds in plants, which are used in plants to defend them against herbivores and things like, oh, the beetle larvae that bore through leaves, uh, aphids, uh, caterpillars, all of, the, all of those sorts of things. So plants have evolved a tremendous array of poisons to basically protect themselves largely against insects. And when we encounter those poisons, we also react to them. Now, in the modern world, this is also the system that provides protection against artificial chemicals in the environment, xenobiotics, 
and toxic drug, drug metabolites. So here is actually the pathway by which Tylenol is detoxified by cytochrome P450. And almost all of the drugs that we take are dealt with by enzymes that evolved in the past, either in us or in distant ancestors, to deal with toxins that were being produced by plants. Now, finally, let's take a look, an initial look, at the immune response to infection. The immune system that is there to defend against infections by microbes, and it detects infection by recognizing conserved microbial products. So these are so-called markers of the presence in the body of a pathogen, and they are things like lipopolysaccharides and peptidoglycans. These are not things that are produced usually by a eukaryotic cell. They are typical signs that some prokaryote has invaded the body. They are recognized by the innate immune system. And the innate immune system then triggers the inflammatory response, and that consists of phagocytosis, so eating up bacteria or viruses. The complement system is activated. The complement system is a set of molecules in the bloodstream that can coat bacteria and make it easier for macrophage to ingest them. It activates natural killer cells, which can kill infected cells in the body, not directly killing the bacteria or the viruses, but killing the cells that have been come, become infected and thereby getting that whole infection, infection complex taken out of action. And also there are antibacterial defenses that are going to be activated. So all of this gets switched on very quickly by the innate immune response. It can react uh, with a very short reaction time. However, it also activates the adaptive immune response, and that is something that's mediated by T and B lymphocytes. T lymphocytes mature in the thymus, and B lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow. Adaptive immune recognition uses antigen receptors. These are antibodies and T cell receptors. And these antigen receptors are extremely diverse. They're generated at random by somatic recombination, by gene conversion, and by random pairing of receptor subunits, and they can make millions of antigen receptors that collectively can recognize almost any antigen. So they allow very specific responses that can then, in time, overwhelm very specifically a particular pathogen or even a particular cancer cell type. Now, because they're made at random, they cannot determine the origin of antigens. So they don't know uh, by themselves whether they're dealing with self, with a microbial pathogen, or with some innocuous environmental antigen. And this is part of the lymphocyte response right here. So in that same picture, we can see a T lymphocyte here. And as we go through the immune system, we will see that the cellular response, the adaptive immune response, uh, relies on cell-to-cell -cell communication. It relies on different kinds of cells, T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, and things like that. And because it's a cellular response, and cells take time to divide and to build up a population, it takes time. The innate immune system is the part of our defense mechanism that determines where an antigen came from. Did it come from a virus? Did it come from an extra or intracellular bacterium? Or is it a eukaryotic parasite that's being dealt with? So the innate immune system detects that and then tells the adaptive immune system what it's dealing with. That's why the innate immune recognition is required to activate the adaptive immune response. And then the adaptive immune response differs with the kind of pathogen that's been detected. A key feature of adaptive immunity is the ability to remember. 
So if a pathogen is encountered in a two or three year old child, then a set of B cells is recruited and remembers the reaction to that pathogen. And if it is encountered 50 years later, that population of B cells can be rapidly activated and produce a more rapid response to that particular pathogen. So following that initial exposure, the host is protected from subsequent infection, provided that the antigens of the pathogen remain the same. So as long as the pathogen, that part of the pathogen that's producing the antigen hasn't changed, the host can respond quickly. That is the basis of vaccination. So vaccines mimic infection in order to produce an immunological memory. And it's that immunological memory that is protecting against future infections. This is what an antigen, uh, an antibody to an antigen looks like. It's a Y structure and it has a variable part and it has a constant part. And it has four units at its tips. And these are the four units that can be recombined in many, many different combinations. So this is actually the business end of the adaptive immune system. These powerful defense mechanisms are associated with some diseases. Allergies, asthma, and autoimmunity are all diseases that result from immune defense. Thrombosis and embolism result from the coagulation defense. Fibrosis, for example, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which can cause people to die from inability to breathe, is an exaggeration of tissue repair. Squamous metaplasia is a case where you have a tissue protection from mechanical damage. So those are things like calluses and corns, where you have an exaggeration that can lead to pain. Obesity is an exaggeration of our defense from starvation. Hypertension is an exaggeration of our defense from dehydration. Diabetes type 2 is an exaggeration of our homeostatic fuel reallocation mechanism. And obsessive compulsive disorder leads to germophobia, which is an exaggeration of our normal avoidance of infection. Agoraphobia, or fear of being out in an open place, is exaggerated predator, predator avoidance behavior. So you can see there's a theme running through this. And the theme is that every defense mechanism brings with it, through its trade-offs, a cost. And the exaggeration of that cost can lead to a disease. So to summarize. Organismal responses to environmental stressors are physiological adaptations, and they are extensions of normal homeostasis. While at the extremes they have some specialized characteristics, they are all evolutionary modifications of processes operating normally. That might seem a little less obvious for the immune defense, the detoxification response, and tissue repair, but all of these have a non-defensive counterpart. The management of microbiota and tissue homeostasis for the immune system, metabolic regulation for the detoxification system, and tissue renewal in the case of tissue repair. So you can see that in fact there is a, another big take home message in this talk, and that is that every defense is an evolutionary modification of something that has also a normal physiological function in the absence of the hostile challenge. And every kind of defense produces a characteristic associated disease.